Next up is Anna McWilliam, senior researcher, and Sofia hmm? Olsson, okay. who is analyst, uh, both representing the Swedish Defense Research Agency. This year, they published a report, Threats Against Heritage, an analysis of actor-driven threats against heritage in Sweden, commissioned by the Swedish National Heritage Board. We will, in their presentation, get an insight of the mechanisms behind the constant changes in threat scenarios. Welcome to the stage, Anna McWilliams and Sofia Olsson. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for having us here to talk about the work that we've been doing recently, uh, which is focused on actor-driven threats against heritage. Uh, my name is Anna McWilliams, and I am a researcher and I'm an, an archaeologist. That was hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, as you heard, I'm Sofia Olsson, and I'm an analyst, and we come from the Swedish Defense Research Agency. Uh, today we're going to talk mainly about this uh, piece of work that Katrin mentioned here that we did on behalf of the Swedish National Heritage Board last year. And this was um, uh, an, 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 it's difficult speaking today. We're, we're having troubles up here, aren't we? Technical and speech-wise, but let's try it again. We did an analysis of what kind of threats, sort of actor-driven threats, that Sweden could face in case of war or conflict. Um, and it was, uh, the analysis focused on threats in which an actor could damage, distort, or in other ways use heritage uh, in order to cause harm. And this means that we didn't include uh, threats that were of um, accidents or natural disasters, uh, but it's focused on actor-driven threats. Uh, we published a report on this uh, earlier this year, in January. It's available if people want to read it. It's only in Swedish, I'm afraid, but some of you might be able to read it anyway. Um, and the main target group for this uh, report that we, uh, that we wrote this for was, um, were those actors that manage heritage in different ways. Um, and the threat assessment was to help them understand what kind of threats that Sweden could face uh, and that they needed to include in their contingency plans. Yes, and before we go into the results, just a few words about like, how we did it. <laughs> so we combined information from different unclassified sources, such as the general uh, assessment of threats against the Swedish society from the Swedish military intelligence services, uh, Swedish security services, as well as the National Center for Terrorist Threat Assessment. We also conducted some interviews with different experts within the total defense, um, the Swedish total defense, and then we looked at how heritage has been affected by war uh, internationally. Thereafter, we asked them the question, well, what can, can this mean for heritage in the Swedish context? Um, and our results demonstrates that the actor-driven threat towards heritage in Sweden is very broad, and it includes both, so to speak, traditional military threats as well as hybrid threats. We also see that the border between um, peace and war is far from clear, and that some threats are present already in peacetime. So we divided the threats up in four different categories in the report. Uh, physical destruction, theft, cyber threats, and influence. Um, and this does not mean that these are clear categories in the real world, um, but they helped us to, to uh, sort of um, uh, make, to, to make clear the kind of different threats that are out there. Many different of these threats um, overlap when they're used. So, physical destruction. Now, this is often the kind of idea we get in our head when we hear the words heritage and war in the same sentence. Uh, and it's something that we see in Ukraine now, and this threat we can see is still highly relevant. Now, 
Physical damage can be caused by collateral damage when something else is the actual target, but that heritage in the vicinity gets uh, damaged in the process. Uh, and the main target could be a military site or some other strategic target. Um, and damages from Russian strikes in Ukraine that shows us that attacks on military as well as civilian targets, such as infrastructure, um, is still a very high present threat in war. We have one example in the picture here, which is the destruction of the cathedral in Odessa. Um, but apart from collateral damage, heritage can also be destroyed uh, intentionally. The reason for this can be to destroy evidence of a historical narrative that the attacker um, does not agree with. Uh, it could be to create fear or confusion, or to deny people access to the knowledge of this heritage. We have also included sabotage as part of uh, physical damage, and this can be carried out by many different groups. It can be done in peace, in, war, uh, in hybrid warfare, as well as traditional kinetic warfare. An example of sabotage that we use in the report uh, is to use violence against heritage or art in order to protest against climate change. And we saw almost exactly a year ago, uh, we saw an attack on a Monet painting in the Swedish National Gallery. Um, International conflict also shows us that theft of heritage, such as museum objects or uh, from archaeological sites, are common. And we also then see that that would be likely to happen also in Sweden in case of war. This is partly due to the difficulties of protecting heritage in unrest. Uh, it could be due to uh, damage of buildings, such as museum buildings, uh, making it easier to actually access objects. But it can also be caused by uh, security, such as police or security staff being uh, busy with other tasks and don't actually have the uh, possibility to protect heritage. The reason behind the thefts vary greatly. It could be economic incentives, but it could also be that the heritage in question has a high symbolic value that, is, that it's considered uh, important. Mm -hmm. And since the 1990s, heritage has uh, increasingly become more digitalized, which of course is a positive thing, not least uh, when we talk about accessibility. However, it also comes with a new type of threats of a cyber nature. Cyber attacks can of course cause major damage to collection, collection, collect directly and indirectly. For example, a direct attack can harm digital archives by attacking the data, but it can also be a direct attack on the institutions themselves. One example being the British Library that last year was submitted to, subjected to a ransomware attack. But it can also be like second-hand effect or collateral damage, meaning that the actual target of the cyber attack could be, for example, a service provider um, of some sort, and the cascade effect then has implication also for the cultural heritage or its guarding institution. And as the British examples show, and also the um, cyber attack against uh, Tito Veri, um, these types of threats are present in uh, peacetime as well as in wartime. And we also see an increase in the way that cultural heritage is used by actors uh, who want to influence an audience in order to shape their um, perception or behavior. And as we have heard, heritage is something that is valued by people and is often considered part or, of, or a manifestation of a people's uh, history, identity and culture. It is a tool that can be used for what broadly can be described as psychological warfare. And this can, of course, take a lot of different forms, including physical destruction. Uh, we have already heard about the, the uh, Islamic State's destruction of Palmyra, which not only then was a destruction of a World Heritage Site, but it was also used in the propaganda and recruitment, like uh, PR, for example, like a sort of PR thing. Uh, and we also see that heritage and culture is used as part of the information warfare, um, as part of information campaigns and as uh, 
part of information activities. One example being how um, Swedish cultural profiles were painted out as Nazis on posters that suddenly appeared in Russia as Sweden was submitting its NATO membership application. The main point here is that heritage might be the visible target, however the actual target is the people who value this heritage. Yes, so this was a very fast fly through the threat assessment that we carried out last year. And one conclusion that can be drawn from the Swedish perspective it is that the threat is broader than what we historically have included in our contingency plans for heritage protection. Um, which has mainly been focused perhaps on more uh, physical destruction of heritage. And following our assessment, this means that the planning we have put in place for heritage protection so far may not be broad enough. So therefore, we need to ask ourselves some perhaps difficult questions. If the threat is broader, how do we protect heritage more holistically? How do we ensure that it's not used for information campaigns? How do we keep it safe from cyber attacks? And what can we learn from each other? We may also need to reconsider how we value heritage uh, and also how an adversary may value it. We've heard a lot about that from Frederick now, that there are different views uh, on how we use heritage. And even though precious metals may always be targeted as, uh, from a theft perspective, it's not clear what will be targeted if the purpose uh, is to cause confusion, anger or fear, when the aim of the perpetrator is to provoke or to polarize. We also believe that there is a lot we need to understand connected to intangible heritage and how that is protected, such as customs, beliefs, traditions. And here the border between what is intangible heritage and culture more generally is thin or at times not really existing. We need to understand that the things that matter to us can also be an efficient way or an effective way for someone to cause us harm. But because it matters to us, we might also here have an opportunity. It can mean that heritage and culture can also be a way to create resilience. Yes. Um, here, however, we do need more studies that can help us understand this further. For example, then the, the relationship between heritage and culture and resilience, as well as society's capability to defend itself against perpetrators that might use this against us. And during Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, as well as the ongoing full-scale invasion of Ukraine, we have seen examples of how participating and uh, performing heritage and culture has been the way well, it appears to have played a role in strengthening the Ukrainian society's resilience. And we are currently, Anna and I together, uh, carrying out a study where we want to examine or observe more this uh, Ukrainian experience further to see this more. Hmm? Uh, finally then, from the Swedish example, we conclude that we need to strengthen the cooperation between different actors. And I know Fredrik's already been in uh, that discussion, because how heritage and culture is damaged, used, or as it has it becomes a target in war, it's not just a question for the cultural sector, it's a question for both military and civil defense. We often hear that the culture sector need to learn more about the military and civil defense, and that is probably true, but we don't hear so often that um, the military and the civil defense needs to learn more about heritage and culture. And we believe that's the way forward if we are to meet these threats, these broader threats that we see. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here are some of our reports on the subject, oh. however, in Switch. <laughs> Thank you, Anna and Sophia. Uh, I've taken a peek in your report, and uh, I noticed that you don't really point out specifically any uh, Swedish heritage that is threatened. How come you haven't done that? 
No, we haven't done that. That's a great disappointment to all the journalists who want to get, you know, a really great headline. Um, so we've disappointed them. Uh, but there is, there's, um, that was never the purpose of the report. Uh, we believe that the managers who, who manage different heritage are the ones that are better to know how to protect it against... Uh, against what. So we have very specifically not gone into that. The report is to show what kind of things could happen, what mm. kind of uh, threats there could be, so that the actors then can, can yeah, plan that. Of yeah. Course, yeah. Of course. Yeah, and uh, we also, our view on heritage is that it's dependent on the context. So um, it means different things to different people and it varies over time. And as we talked about in the, in the presentation, um, the actor during threats against heritage is very much dependent on the aim of the perpetrator. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I also have another question. Uh, in Sweden, we've seen an increasing number of cyber threats, but also uh, several influence campaigns against authorities. Uh, what are the most important measures that we can take now on a national level? And uh, what is best developed on an international level? Question. Yeah, <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> but I mean, when it comes to, to uh, the influence operation part, then uh, of course, I mean, spreading the knowledge that this is a way that our, um, well, threat actors want to use this against us is, of course, one way to try to combat this. Because if sure. we know more, then of course, we will be more resilient towards these kind of attacks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, I think that, yeah. and I think I refer back to Fredrik's um, presentation as well. Um, I think we need to understand that people who want to harm us have a very different way of doing this, a yeah. very strategic way of doing it, yeah. and, and that would be a great start to, to understand that better Absolutely. and how that works. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Sophia and Thank Anna. Thank you. <clears throat>